Hello, welcome to the IEA's YouTube channel. My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General here at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and I'm joined by my colleague Christopher Snowden, the Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute, to uh, get his reaction to the recently announced scrapping of Public Health England uh, by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. Warm welcome to you, Chris. Good to see you as always. And you, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Uh, are you popping the champagne corks and, corks and lighting a big fat cigar, Chris? Is this the news you have been longing for? The Public Health England has been the bane of your life in its existence since 2013. How many times did you punch the air, or would that be a bit premature? Uh, quite a few. I'm, uh, I'm relishing the moment. It is something I've been uh, looking forward to and kind of campaigning for for some time, some years, because I mean, I just think, I've thought for a long time that Public Health England is incompetent apart from anything else i think it's also quite wasteful um and it gets involved in a lot of things it shouldn't be getting involved in but it's primarily it's, it's incompetent it has been on a number of issues and it's quite satisfying that so many people um thanks to the um you know, the, the the mess that's been made over the last six months with coronavirus have come around to that way of thinking and that the government's come around to that way of thinking so i don't know what comes next but this is pretty much what i've been suggesting for a long time that phe be either heavily reformed and slimmed down so it's only dealing with infectious diseases and environmental hazards or scrapped and replaced um, by the kind of thing that Matt Hancock is now suggesting, this National Institute for Health Protection, which seems to me to be really just a return to the days before PHE when we had the Health Protection Agency, which did exactly that. It only looked at infectious diseases. It didn't stick its nose into you know political issues or alcohol regulation or trying to reformulate bread and what have you it just looked at infectious diseases and i don't think it the health protection agency was scrapped for any particular reason it was there was just this big you know the big lansley reforms and moving public health back to the local councils seemed for some reason to require the creation of yet another big bureaucratic leviathan so yeah i'm, I'm very pleased uh, that it's gone but let, uh, let's um, help me and, and our viewers with the, with the autopsy of Public Health England, Chris, if you will. Uh, I mean, the um, handling of the pandem pandemic and the lockdown and testing and all of the rest of it has led to a sort of blame game. Starting with COVID-19 in particular, and then I'll, I'll ask you uh, afterwards about mission creep in Public Health England. What should it have done? I mean, what would be what would have been your optimal public health England, where you would have given the state bureaucracy and the quango a slap on the back for a job well done? And what specifically did it do wrong, or was it unprepared for in terms of the COVID nineteen pandemic? The things it specifically got wrong um, involved contact tracing, um, involved the counting of deaths. I think that was the the final straw actually that broke the camel's back when it was discovered that PHE has not been counting COVID deaths properly. It's had this fairly ridiculous system in which um, it is just assumed that once you've tested positive for COVID, that if you die of any cause and any point ever in the future, you are a COVID death. That's well, including being hit by a bus, much. for example. Absolutely. Well, it, yeah, it meant that the, however many people have tested positive for COVID, well over 100,000, all those people under PHE system would have to die for COVID. Even if it's in 20 years' time and COVID's been wiped off the face of the earth, they would still be dying of COVID. The rest of the UK, um, you know, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, they had a, a more sensible system in which you were assumed to have recovered if you hadn't died within 28 days. It's not a perfect system either. I think actually Scotland has been undercounting deaths a little bit, but we were massively overcounting deaths. And of course, the longer this goes on, the more, the more deaths you're um, overcounting. So there was an element of mismeasurement there, which to be fair, wasn't fatal. It, it was incompetent, but it didn't actually kill anybody. Yeah, does that matter too much? I mean, okay, it does mean that the numbers are inaccurate, but isn't the job of a public health agency protection rather than measurement i mean we obviously want to know how many people have died of it but surely the aim was to take actions that would minimize that number however you count it indeed and that's where the the testing and the tracing come in um so public health england were very poor in rolling out the diagnostic testing they were pretty good actually in developing the test it has to be said but then it needed to be rolled out and they had a rather kind of insular and parochial view of um, the private sector. They just wanted the NHS to do it. Well, they wanted their own labs to do it initially. Then they rolled it out to the NHS labs. 
at the same time in Korea and Taiwan and Germany, the private sector was being involved from the outset. And in Germany, they had, I think, something like 80 labs working on these um, on, on these tests. So they could roll out a huge number of them. This is not just the making of the test, I should say. This is the processing of the test. That's the real issue. Um, you've got to have somewhere where you, you're getting the, um, the result from them. So Public Health England were very slow to deal with the private sector, even though apparently businesses were literally ringing them up and not getting put through to the right person. So there was a, a bad attitude towards the private sector, which isn't surprising, actually, if you look at Public Health England's work on, on alcohol and, and tobacco. They're kind of very suspicious of industry anyway. And then there was this decision to stop the contact tracing on, I think, the 12th of March. And there's an extraordinary video of, um, I forget her name, somebody quite high up in PHE, appearing before the select committee back in, I think, April. And when asked why they decided to not follow the South, South Korean model of mass uh, uh, testing in, in the community, and instead actually just rolled it back and just tested a few health workers and a few people who actually uh, uh, brought into hospital she just said that's a good question i'll have to think about that i mean she just didn't know there wasn't there wasn't an answer to it the committee has since by the way been chasing her up um because she said at the time that, that she would publish the evidence upon which that decision was made and despite several letters from the select committee saying well where is it then there just hasn't been a, a response so there's kind of negligence and incompetence there you're right about the the counting that's just incompetence but the the, the lack of contact tracing and the the failure to roll out the diagnostic testing was lethal and it left it probably left us in lockdown longer than we needed to be apart from anything else which of course is very economically costly okay but um try and talk me and our viewers chris through the the size and nature of public health england and then i want to get on to sort of why this went wrong uh i mean how big is this organization where is it based and where has it been deploying its resources? Was the problem here, for example, that huge amount of resources were being put into, I don't know, combating obesity or um, discouraging people from eating too much chocolate and not enough attention was given to uh, how we would handle a pandemic as and when one came along? What, how has it been spending its time in so far as you can discern that over the past well, over the seven years of its existence, really. How big is it, and what's it been doing with all its resources? I mean, it's pretty big. I mean, its budget is over £4 billion a year, and Public Health England hate it when you say that, because they would say their operating budget is much smaller, around about £300 million a year. What actually happens is, uh, when the Lansley reforms came in, the idea was that people in local government were going to be uh, supplying public health services. So... Each local authority gets a local public health director on a six-figure salary, and they get a budget, which technically comes from Public Health England. So of that £4 billion, over £3 billion of it goes out to the local authorities. So you can and, and that's to help people cut down on drinking, take exercise, stop smoking, that sort of stuff. Well, I mean, all of it is, yeah. I mean, and, and very little, if any, it goes towards pandemic planning at, at the local level. Um, so yeah, there's something like 220 million spent on obesity, over 100 million spent on tobacco control and stop smoking services. Then there are the more, what me and you would probably consider more legitimate expenses, uh, sexual uh, health clinics, uh, children's services, health advice for people who want it. Public Health England itself, it actually has a budget of rather more than 300 million pound, actually. It's, uh, it, it's got around about half a billion pound specifically for infectious diseases. That's both routine vaccinations, which it, it's in charge of stockpiling, are sort of MMR, TB jabs, that kind of thing, but also preparatory vaccinations. Um, so it, it, it stockpiles and actually throws away every year a huge, huge amount of um, vaccines, but that's what it's supposed to do. This is part of being prepared for a pandemic. It's not Public Health England's fault that the, the current pandemic doesn't have a vaccine. If it had been a version of swine flu, perhaps it would have been more useful. It's not, interestingly, in charge of stockpiling PPE or anything like that. And there's a big dispute about who's really in charge of pandemic preparation per se. If you read PHE's documents before coronavirus, you would get the strong impression it was PHE. And they are indeed responsible for certain bits of it, such as the contact tracing. But actually, in terms of the overall plan, it seems to be more of the NHS and Department of Health. I think that when this new agency comes into effect, the National Institute for Health uh, Protection, 
I think it should be a one-stop shop. You know, I think they should be entirely responsible for the modeling, for the planning, for the stockpiling, and for implementing the plan itself. So there are no excuses. I think it, it should be, you know, the book should stop with that organization because there has been, you're right, there has been a lot of book passing with this and it hasn't all been PhD's fault. And I'm sympathetic to the view that PhD has been made a scapegoat for some of the mistakes that have been made in government. But it has made enough mistakes on its own terms to justify being scrapped without a shadow of a doubt. And, and I want to be clear, Chris, whether you think that those mistakes, I mean, you, you, you've compared our response to, let's say, that of South Korea. I mean, is this systemic? Because the way we've configured Public Health England, it's not really clear who's responsible for what, a fairly typical problem in the state bureaucracy, but we haven't had sufficiently delineated lines of responsibility. Or is it that PHE's sort of mission was drawn too widely? It was, you know, interested in, you know, tobacco, alcohol, confectionery, everything that you could think of, which, uh, you know, any health issue that might affect a member of the public rather than specifically on pandemics? Or is it just a personnel failure? I mean, if the leadership of the of PHE has been at fault, there's no need to scrap it, right? You just need to get rid of those people and bring in more competent ones. Yeah, I think it's a bit of all of those things, really. I think it is a failure of leadership. I think primarily it's a failure of strategy. If we're just talking about the contact tracing and the testing aspects of it, there was an unwillingness to change their plan. You know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, as, as Mike Tyson said. And the plan of PHE, not just PHE, but also of the chief medical officer, the chief scientific advisor, um, the Department of Health, it was all based around flu. It was fighting the last war. It was swine flu, um, you know, avian flu. That's going to be the next big thing. They weren't, for some reason, expecting the coronavirus, despite the fact that we'd had SARS not that very long ago. And with, with flu, you don't try and contain it. You can try and contain it initially, and the, there's a policy of testing the first few hundred people just to really work out what kind of virus it is. But after that, you just essentially give up. There's no point trying to contact trace people. It's going to go across the whole of the community sooner or later. You can't stop it. You maybe try and flatten the curve, and that's it. And they were unable to – they weren't agile enough, you know, perhaps intellectually, to, to see by mid-March that this was different and that mass contact tracing, which had been used so successfully in other parts of the world, was actually the way to, to flatten the curve, aside from anything else. I mean, I, I don't I think anybody really thinks, apart from perhaps the New Zealand Prime Minister, that you can uh, completely eradicate this. But they, they just kept on going on this influenza pandemic plan when it was clear that they were dealing with a very different beast. Um, and, of course, with hindsight, you can say if they hadn't spent so much money on their anti-obesity crusades and, and, and waffling on about alcohol regulation and health inequalities and all these other things, then it would have been better prepared for the pandemic. And of course, that is at least trivially true. Um, and you can say a lot of things with hindsight, but I have to say, I did say it beforehand. I have been saying for several years that public health England should just be there for contagious diseases and that it was spreading, its, spreading itself too thinly over all these other issues. And it has certainly given the impression over the years that it's much more interested in, in, in calories and food rather than pandemics. So what comes next? I mean, what do we know about what comes next? We've got this, the, the National Institute for Health Protection. Uh, I mean, is this just a rebranding exercise? It's going to be completely the same people with different headed note paper? Or is there already an explicit explicit change in the, the mission statement? I think uh, Matt Hancock, the health secretary, has already distinguished in his words between health protection and health improvement. So if we're going to delineate those responsibilities, where's the sort of health improvement stuff go? What happens to the employees of Public Health England? If I am the Public Health England local government officer in my borough, do I lose my job? Uh, is it going to be a completely new bunch of personnel with different skills who know about coronaviruses and don't know as much about calories? What, what happens next? Or is it a blank sheet of paper at the moment? Well, nothing much will change at the local level. And that's where most of the money is being spent. Um, so I think that's the first important thing to say. At the PHE level, the PHE is gone. The CEO resigned um, straight after Matt Hancock's announcement this week. He's been replaced. And the various people will, will work on this new institute. Clearly, a lot of the scientists who work in the PHE labs and science campuses will be maintained. 
to some extent, it will be just be a matter of changing the letterheads, but presumably the, the management will be cleared out and new people will be brought in and its mission will be fundamentally changed from, as you say, health improvement to health protection. And I thought it was very interesting and very important that Matt Hancock used those phrases. I've ne- I don't remember ever hearing a politician, let alone a public health person, make that distinction before between health protection and health improvement with the clear implication that the protection is much more important with the improvement. And of course, he's right. And it's the thing I've been banging, out, banging on about for years about how the, the, the phrase public health is so misleading because it covers things like pandemics, but also whether people are doing enough jogging. And we need to make that critical distinction between infectious diseases and environmental hazards from which the individual cannot necessarily protect themselves and therefore the government coercion and government action may be necessary and things like how many cream cakes you consume and whether you want to smoke or not and how many units of alcohol you consume, which you don't need the government to decide for you. You don't need the government's uh, help, let alone coercion. You can make those decisions yourself. So the question is, what will happen to that stuff? You know, what will happen to the health improvement stuff? And that we don't know. Now, as you know, Mark, I'm not a great optimist. You might be thinking that you know, it's all going to be gone now. We're just going to have this pandemic preparation organization and the rest of it's going to be thrown out the window. I can't see it happening, unfortunately, um, because the, the political pressure will be enormous, particularly given the government's just announced all these anti-obesity policies. The idea that it would then simply disband the main national agency that works on obesity prevention, um, I think is is very very unlikely to happen so will we see now the creation of nanny state england or the the national institute for health improvement i hope i hope not obviously but i mean not just because i'm i don't think the government should be getting involved in these areas i think it genuinely would be wasteful i wrote a piece in the spectator this week in which i suggested that you know if, if all we're doing is winding the clock back seven years to when we had the health protection agency then all the rest of the health improvement stuff can be done as it was seven years ago, which is to say by the Department of Health, by local authorities, and by the NHS. I can't really think of anything apart from perhaps the PHE's ludicrous food reformulation scheme, which can die in a ditch anyway, as far as I'm concerned. I can't think of anything PHE's currently been doing that can't be done equally well by the Department of Health or the NHS or the local public health teams. So no, please you know, do not create yet another bureaucratic leviathan it would be terrible if, if we, we scrap phe and just end up creating two big uh, national organizations but so, so i'm trying to work out where the the sort of the bureaucrats and the state agencies that you rail against chris are going to go i mean if i'm the if i'm in charge of a budget at a local borough which is all about um I don't know, smoking cessation services and uh, encouraging obese people to start jogging and eat fewer cream cakes. What happens to me next? I mean, do I just carry on as the National Institute for Health Protection Officer doing these things, or do I now come within the local authority budget, or do I uh, change my attention, or am I replaced by somebody who would work out how we would facilitate a lockdown in my local borough if another pandemic hit us? I, what, what do you see happening to the, the actual people on the front line here? I mean, is anything going to change at all? I don't think so. No, and the, the local public health directors and their teams are pretty much autonomous from Public Health England. They are technically appointed by Public Health England um, uh, in agreement with the local councils themselves, I think. But they, they go off and they do their own thing. They, you know, they have a certain responsibility to spend certain bits of money on certain projects, but they're, they're pretty autonomous in terms of what they spend their money on, um, it, only beyond the fact that the public health budget is ring-fed, so it has to go on, on public health. So I don't really see these people's jobs changing very much. It wasn't as if the public health England was directly pushing them around and not ordering them about. The change will come for some of the people in the management and middle management of public health England, who presumably will all be out of work. So if you are in the, the um, you know, food reformulation team at Public Health England, you will be at least temporarily redundant. Um, and I don't think that's, that's any bad thing at all. But you're right, it's, there's a lot of people uh, going to lose their jobs and they're pretty well remunerated jobs in public health, so they're not going to be happy about it. And that's why I think it's inevitable the government will um, continue, you know, certainly think about creating a new nanny state agency uh, 
And it certainly won't stop doing the anti-smoking, the anti-food, anti-alcohol stuff. It will do it in some form or other. It's not at all clear at the moment how they're going to do it. They might push more of it to the local authorities. You know, I certainly don't see local authorities being damaged by this in any way. Um, but yeah, some people are going to lose their jobs. Hooray for that. Um, maybe we can employ some more people in pandemic uh, preparation instead. So obviously some of the defenders of Public Health England, have, which is often the refrain from state actors, have bemoaned the lack of resources. Back in May, you uh, wrote for the IA, false economies, myths about public health spending. And we'll make sure there's a link to that document in the show notes uh, below on YouTube. What are the false economies and what are the myths, Chris? Oh, well, the myths, um, put, put simply, the myth is that the more money you spend on public health, the more money you save in the long run. One of the sort of factoids that's sometimes thrown around is that every pound spent on public health will save 14 pounds in the long run, which if that were true, you'd just spend... An infinite amount of money. Well, certainly at least 10 or 20 billion pounds on public health, and then you, you wouldn't need to spend anything on healthcare at all. But of course, that 14 pounds isn't actually a, a, a legitimate saving to taxpayers it is overwhelmingly uh, and a sort of arbitrary monetary figure placed on a year of life and then there's rather optimistic projections put around how much uh, how many years of life are saved by public health actions which as we both know are often extremely ineffective so that that is um one of the, the myths of it another myth incidentally is that public health england has been massively underfunded uh, it is true that the public health grant has dropped over the years, well, in the last seven years since Public, public Health England was, was formed. But that has no effect on pandemic preparation, number one, because the local authorities weren't really involved in that. Um, number two, PHE um, saw its own spending on what is basically infectious disease control increase uh, significantly over that period. And uh, number three, it was massively funded to start with. You know, four billion pounds is a huge amount of money. If you compare that to the uh, Health Protection Agency's budget in its last year in operation, which was well under two hundred million pounds. So uh, the reality is that this quango was given an enormous sum of cash, as as were the local councils. Local councils' budget was whittled away a little bit, although it's since been um, b- banged up again. You cannot blame this on underfunding. You can argue certainly that they've spent the money on the wrong things, but you can't blame it on uh, underfunding overall and just finally chris uh for those of us who uh, know that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance what should we be looking for in the development of this new agency the national institute for health protection in order to make sure that it doesn't suffer from the same sort of mission creep uh, i mean i've suggested to politicians that every time public health england or now this new agency puts out something about confectionery or hamburgers or sugar, uh, they should be told to shut up unless it's about bat soup from a Chinese wet market or some equivalent thereof. What sort of uh, terms of reference should uh, uh, people of a liberal mindset be hoping for or even uh, demanding? And uh, how are you going to be keeping an eye on whether this new agency really is involved in in protecting us and planning against the, the next pandemic whatever it is and whenever it comes, as opposed to uh, spending its time involved in cream cakes and beer and cigarettes. It's an interesting point. I hadn't really considered that seriously, the idea that the the actual infectious disease agency might start getting involved in cream cakes and pizzas. Um, I think it's probably fairly unlikely to happen. I mean, just going on what Matt Hancock said, he said something to the effect that this agency would have a relentless and single-minded focus on infectious disease and biohazards and so on. So I, I think it would be fairly difficult if that was their mission statement for them to start getting involved in minimum pricing for alcohol and vaping and so on. Um, but I mean, it's been made clear what the mission is, so we, we can certainly monitor that. I would assume that it's going to be employing the the kind of people who quietly got on with their jobs actually in in the PHE labs the people you didn't hear anything about one of the shame one of the problems and shame about public health England is actually it did a huge amount of good work behind the scenes and it's stuff on on uh, gene sequencing and so on was was top class as far as I'm aware obviously we've got some fantastic scientists in this country and a lot of them work for public health England it's just that the public facing side of public public health England was always about you know, you shouldn't have more than 400 calories in your, in your dinner and, and, and that kind of stuff, which made them a bit of a laughingstock in the end. 
So uh, you, you mentioned earlier, Chris, that optimism doesn't come to you naturally, but you, you, some cause for celebration here, right? I mean, you've been railing against this quango for uh, a number of years and, and some of its more idiotic uh, acts of behaviour, even if um, some chunk of its work, the less prolific stuff, is actually the important stuff. I mean, broadly speaking, classical liberals should be uh, happy and encouraged about what's just happened. Right. I mean, is your uh, whenever I ask you your optimism rating, it's low. But has it at least been dialed up by this news? Yeah, you can't not celebrate this, of course. And even if the worst happens in the future, as it often does, and actually nanny state England is formed in six months time. I and mean, it's even more heavily funded and heavily staffed than public health England. At least we still we will still have this moment, you know, and we don't get very many victories. So we'll celebrate them, even if they turn out to be Pyrrhic. So, yeah, it's, I live for schadenfreude. Uh, it's all about um, vengeance for me. So, you know, some people have been annoying me for a number of years have now lost their jobs. Um, so, yeah, it's a good thing. I mean, public health England was bad and it was only going to get worse. It's very satisfying that people have come around to my way of thinking on public health England and also on the World, World Health Organization, incidentally, which also should go down this path of being either very much slimmed down so it's only focusing, focusing on pandemics or replaced. Um, I mean, I know that's a, a bigger ask and requires international cooperation, but I think the principle here certainly should apply to the World Health, Health Organization. But for now, yes, I'm very happy about it. Also very happy that Turkey Twizzlers are going to be back on the menu soon. It's been a very bad week for Jamie Oliver and therefore a very good week for Britain. Chris, thanks so much and congratulations to you for all the work you've done. I'm sure uh, the World Health Organization will now be shivering that they're the next uh, uh, quango or institute that's in your sniper scope. Uh, Chris, thanks very much indeed for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, broadcast. We'll include in the links below uh, Chris's paper on false economies, also a link to uh, a recent webinar that he conducted on pandemics and prohibitions, and a link to the Spectator article that uh, Chris referenced earlier. Um, if you've enjoyed this broadcast, please hit the like button on YouTube. Please also subscribe and, um, and share the video by hitting the share button under YouTube. Also follow us on Twitter at IEA London and on Facebook. Uh, Chris, it's been a pleasure having you with us. Uh, congratulations on your part in this uh, victory for freedom and common sense and look forward to speaking to you, Chris, again soon. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Mark.